Have you ever been faced with integrals of the type shown here, where a and b can be any constants, and wondered how you would do this integral? Most people first encounter such integrals when studying the topic of integration by parts. These particular integrals are performed by parts, but they require a special application of the by parts integration. It's called cyclic integration by parts. You have to integrate by parts twice, making sure that the second time you make the same assignment of u and v primed as you did the first time. That is to say, if the first time you choose u to be e to the ax and v primed to be, say, cos bx, then in the second stage of the integration by parts you must again choose the u to be the exponential and the v prime to be the trig function and not the other way round. If you do that, then you get to the point where you can rearrange the expressions you've got and solve to get an expression for the individual integrals. That's not what we're going to do here, though. People who meet these integrals often in engineering applications, for instance, would quickly become aware that they usually are shown in tables of integrals and formula sheets. So it's always possible to just look up the answer. I want to show you another method for doing the integration, though. It's a rather smart method that involves the use of complex numbers. Here I will write the square root of negative 1 using the symbol j. The method I'm going to show you will enable me to perform both of these integrals at once in one calculation. So it's rather efficient from that point of view. I want to form a new integral that I will call i that's constructed by taking i1 plus j i2. Let's write out what that looks like using the actual structures of the integrals. It looks like this. But then since integration is a linear process, I can combine these two expressions under a single integral symbol. And in that integrand, I can take e to the power ax and recognize it as a factor, collecting the cos and the j times sine together. Oh wow, that's interesting. Cos plus j sine. We've got a name for that expression. It's called cis. Cis of bx. But we also have another way of writing cis. Cis of bx is the same as e to the power j bx. So let's write this integral now using that exponential notation. Well, here it's true that I've had to introduce complex numbers, but don't you think that integral now looks rather simpler? And in fact, if we use the laws for powers, we can make it look simpler still. In fact, so simple that it is very easy to integrate. Don't be put off by the fact that the coefficient of x is a complex number. It's still just an exponential function of x with a constant in front, so we can integrate it as such. I'll do that integration now. As usual, the integration of an exponential is the same exponential, and since the function in the exponential is linear, all we have to do is divide by the coefficient of x. Here that's a plus bj. Doing things this way has made the integration almost trivial, but of course the price we've paid is that we're now going to have to do a bit of complex number algebra. In the next step I'm going to do two things simultaneously. I'm going to deal with that 1 over a plus bj in the usual way, by multiplying the top and bottom by the complex conjugate of the bottom. I'm also going to break the powers of the exponentials up again into two separate exponentials, and take the e to the power ax, that's the real part, off to the left out of the way. So this is the next stage. Just repeat what I did. The e to the power ax is broken off and been pushed out of the way to the left, that leaves e to the bjx on the right, and in between that coefficient with a complex number in the denominator is now being dealt with in the usual way for division of complex numbers. That is, we take the conjugate of the denominator and multiply top and bottom by that conjugate. I hope you remember that now the denominator will become a squared plus b squared. So let's write that out. But at the same time, I'm going to deal with that e to the power bjx. It's just cis x again, isn't it? With a b and cis bx, I mean. 
But then we must remember that cis is the same as cos plus j sine. So let's write it that way. Also taking that a squared plus b squared out of the way to the left because it's real. We've finished with it in a sense. So things now look like this. The cis has been expanded as cos plus j sine. My last step is to multiply out the two brackets with the complex numbers in, separating the real parts and the imaginary parts. I'll talk you through that in steps. Let's first of all write out the coefficient at the front. There we go. e to the ax over a squared plus b squared. Now let's multiply out the two brackets, first of all writing down the real part. There will be an a times cos bx, but there'll be another component to the real part that comes from the multiplication of the things with j's in, minus bj and j sine bx. Remember, j times j is negative 1. And in the first bracket, there's already a negative in front, minus bj. So negative 1 with that extra negative will become plus. The rest of the expression is then just b times sine bx. That's the real part of the product. But there are going to be two other terms in that bracket expansion, the terms with j in, the imaginary part. I'm now going to erase those indicator lines and use some different lines. There, the new lines indicate the parts where we have j's left in the expression. So it looks like, using the long green one, j times a sine bx. Now I've ticked that part of the expression off. And the remaining one is minus b times cos bx with the j in. So that's everything. That's all the algebra I have to do, really. What I need to do now is to go back and remember where all this came from. Do you remember? The integral that we've actually worked out here is the integral that I called i. And it was constructed in two pieces, an i1 and a plus a j i2. i1 and i2 here are, in fact, the real and imaginary parts of i. Let's go back to the bottom and write that down again. First, the structure in terms of the i1 and i2, and then, on the far right-hand side, the actual expression we've just worked out for the integral. And there it is in all its glory. But can you now see that what we have here actually is two separate equations? One is the real part, which tells us about i1, and the other is the imaginary part, which tells us about i2. i1 and i2 were the two original integrals with exponentials and trigs that we wanted to evaluate. We've done them both in one go by using this complex number technique. Let's write out the results. First of all, for i1, that was the integral of e to the ax cos bx. It's the real part of this result, so we isolate the real part in this long expression. I'll circle it now. We just copy this part on the right-hand side of the equals. Then we do the same kind of thing for i2, removing the j and just equating the imaginary parts in the equation. So i2 is equal to... Well, first of all, it's the integral e to the ax sine bx dx, but now we can equate it to the imaginary part in this long expression above. I'll circle that separately and copy it out to the right of the equals symbol. I suppose if I'm being very meticulous, I should also include a plus c term in both these integrals. So that's achieved the two results I wanted. But it's also achieved a side effect that I wanted, which was to demonstrate to you the beauty of the use of complex numbers and how they can act as a sort of bookkeeping device that allows us to carry along more than one calculation at the same time. That makes them a very efficient tool to use in the calculus and in mathematics in general. Complex numbers carry more than one piece of information, so they allow us to manipulate more than one piece of information at once, or in a single calculation. I'll stop there.